Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Sadat Forum on the War in Israel and Gaza, Constructive Campus Conversations. It is truly an honor for me to open this Sadat Forum on such a timely subject, moderated by our very own Professor Shibley Telhami. Shibley is the Anwar Sadat Chair for Peace and Development, which is housed in the College of Behavioral and Social Sciences at the University of Maryland and the director of the highly acclaimed, including his most recent co-edited volume, The One State Reality, What is Israel-Palestine, published earlier this year. And joining us today are three very esteemed panelists. Our panelists have long and very distinguished resumes, which are posted with the announcement on the, of this event. And I invite you to refer to those as I plan to keep my remarks and introductions to a minimum so we can hear more from our guests directly. So first we welcome Amani Jamal, Dean of the Princeton School of Public and International Affairs. She's also the Edward S. Sanford Professor of Politics and directs the workshop on Arab political development and the Bobst American University of Beirut Collaborative Initiative. Among her many publications is her award-winning book, Barriers to Democracy, which explores the role of civic associations in promoting democratic effects in the Arab world. We also welcome Karen Yahi Milo, Dean of Columbia University's School of International and Public Affairs. She's also the Adelaide E. Stevenson Professor of International Relations, and her work explores the complicated contexts that surround decision making signaling, and perception in international relations. Among her many publications is her book, Who Fights for Reputation? The Psychology of Leaders in International Conflict. And last but certainly not least, the third panelist we welcome is Hina Shamsi, who is the director of the ACLU National Security Project, which is dedicated to ensuring that US national security policies and practices are consistent with the constitution, civil liberties, and human rights. Ms. Shamsi has also served as a lecturer in law at Columbia Law School. So thank you distinguished panelists for being here. And thank you to the many people joining us virtually today. We are very, uh, very grateful uh, to have this opportunity to talk about this extremely important and timely topic. So now I will hand this forum over to Shibley. Who is muted? Unmute. <laughs> thank you, Susan, for your uh, introduction. Uh, and, and thank you, Amani, Karen, and Hina uh, for joining us. I really appreciate it. And I mean that deeply because I know how busy you are. This is also, uh, you know, you're always busy, but now, especially at these times, uh, making uh, giving us some time uh, for this uh, is greatly appreciated. Um, uh, you know, this, this is a dark moment for Israelis and Palestinians, certainly. And obviously in a, a crisis that involves the U.S. directly, so it's playing itself out in America as well. Um, we have, uh, it's not that before October 7th, there was uh, peace, uh, justice, and hope uh, in the Israeli-Palestinian arena, there wasn't. But since October 7th, uh, both Israelis and Palestinians uh, have, um, uh, faced uh, horrific uh, events uh, that have uh, led to unprecedented number of civilian casualties uh, and suffering. And um, obviously, um, those dark times uh, that are that have not ended and not likely to end anytime soon, unfortunately, um, have mobilized a lot of people. We, we, you know, it's not just on campuses. We obviously haven't. Uh, today, we will discuss the campus issue. Uh, but it's really in, in across the world, certainly in the Middle East, but in across America, right? We have we have witnessed this, and it's not that this issue has been um, new to America. It's been a, an issue that has polarized publics here as well over the years, and, and we do know that there was a rise in anti-Semitism and Islamophobia uh, before uh, October seventh. Uh, in the past few years, particularly, uh, we've we've witnessed horrific attacks uh, on Jews and Muslims, and, and many um, Jewish worshippers have been massacred in in places of worship. Uh, things that was unprecedented in the history of the United States. Uh, uh, and since October seventh, 
we have also seen a rise in incidents of both anti-Semitism, uh, anti-Palestinian sentiment, anti-Islamic and Arab sentiment uh, across the United States. Uh, we have seen uh, even uh, shootings, unfortunately, killing of a child in Illinois that is an apparent uh, hate crime, uh, the shooting of a child who's a Palestinian-American. Uh, three Palestinian-American students uh, shot in uh, Vermont in another apparent hate crime. Uh, we have ha heard many um, incidents, of anti-Semitic incidents uh, across the country. Uh, this is aside from what we'll focus on today in campus. So this is an issue that has obviously um, polarized people. There are a lot of people uh, on our campuses. Our campuses are all diverse, um, like here at the University of Maryland uh, or at Columbia or Princeton or any campus. Right now across the country, most campuses are diverse. And by diversity, we mean not just ethnic and racial diversity. The U.S. includes a lot of international students. It includes a lot of certainly Jewish students, Muslim students, Israeli students, Palestinian students, Arab students, you know, students from South Asia, uh, uh, from, from across the world. And obviously, you know, this, this is a moment where people are uh, in, you know, paying a lot of attention to it. They're pained by what they see, horrific uh, views of, of, of uh, uh, killings. Um, and uh, in many cases, obviously, people have loved ones. Uh, people know people who've, uh, because the scale of it has been so horrific that we've, you know, it, it, you know, many people on our campus, for example, whether it's faculty or students or, or staff or alumni who have uh, loved ones who've been hurt or people they know they've been hurt. So this is a really painful moment. And it is in a way, it's a zero sum moment in the political context because of the way it lays itself out. And so how do we deal with it on the campuses? We've seen um, incidents, uh, we've seen reports of complaints from student groups, faculty, um, uh, alumni, um, students from outside campuses. We've seen even the intervention of government as we have witnessed recently in um, uh, you know, the congressional hearing with the presidents of several American universities. Um, so this is this is a crisis um, that we all have to uh, contend with. And I think many of us are not really prepared for it, although it's not unusual. We always have crises, but this is on a scale uh, that we have we don't often see. And so I want to start really with you, um, Karen and um, Amani, with the two of you, uh, in part because um, you have, you know, I, I have known the two of you for years. Uh, I've respected the two of you for years because I've, I've known you as scholars. I've known you, I've admired your works. I, I, you know, we were all in the same field, we're all political scientists who work on issues that are very similar. Uh, we've interacted in the past, long before you put on this hat of a dean, and which of course is a hat that none of us are prepared for, honestly. We're not trained to be deans or university administrators, it's something you, it's a learning on the job. And in the middle of a crisis, it's a tough, tough to learn on the job. Um, and so, I want to start with the two of you and ask you, um, you know, by, by in a way, by, by reading the first opening, the, the first paragraph in your article that you wrote on October 30th in the New York Times that you wrote jointly, um, and you put it up front, you know, just at the first paragraph. And, and you said, we're both deans of public policy schools. One of us comes from a Palestinian family displaced by a war. The other served in the Israeli military intelligence before a long career in academia. Our life stories converged when we were colleagues and friends for 10 years on the faculty of Princeton University. Notwithstanding our different backgrounds, we are both alarmed by the climate on campuses and the polarizing and dehumanizing language visible throughout society. And so I want to start with that because I'd like you to give us some context, A, about what it is that uh, led you to want to speak out on this at this time, and what it is that led you to want to speak out together at this time, because those are two different decisions that you have to make, and to put out front a personal background, which is not typical in our field, that one would put out a personal background. So let me start with you, Amani, on this, and then uh, ask Karen to, to follow up on this question. 
Thank you. Thank you so much, Shibli um, and Dean Rivera um, and, and my colleagues. It's such a great honor uh, and privilege to be here with you today. So uh, I'll try to be brief, uh, Shibli. I mean, Karen and I, typically when anything happens in the context of the Middle East, especially Palestine, Israel, we typically will be on the phone with each other or try to at least compare notes like what's going on, what's going on on the Israeli side, what's going on on the Palestinian side. So we were talking, but now we were not only talking as analysts we were talking with each other on the phone as deans and how our own sort of positionality and identity might be shaping the conversation on our campus so you know it's well known we, we don't hide our identities uh Shibli people know that I'm of Palestinian descent Karen is a, of Israeli descent and in a political context and university environments uh, across the U.S. where the conflict is being reduced to zero sum which is if you're pro-Israeli or pro-Jewish, it means you are anti-Palestinian or anti-Muslim. And if you're pro-Palestinian or pro-Muslim, it means by default you're anti-Israeli and anti-Jewish. So we felt like, oh my God, like where's the nuance? This is never really a story. The conflict is not so uh, 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 zero sum, black and white. There's so much nuance in between, right? And the peace camp, which is both Israeli and Palestinian, is not represented in this dialogue at all. And it's, what's even more alarming is that, you know, our students don't even remember a time period where there was a peace process. So we were lamenting about that and trying to figure out, like, what's going on here? Because we haven't seen, to your point, Shibli, we haven't seen this, this crisis and what it means for our campuses in real time. But now our responsibilities and our portfolios are different as deans. So we're trying to sort of grapple with this situation and recognizing that the world right now is so, with all due respect, bimodal, zero sum, us versus them, regardless of what side you're on, we were going to complicate that narrative and we were going to write a joint op-ed to say, first of all, as a Palestinian and as Israeli, we're gonna write together and show the world that we can agree on some common core principles. So that was that in itself probably shattered 75% of what's going on in the world today, Shibli, quite honestly. Um, and now Karen and I have over six additional weeks of uh, unfortunate crises on our college campuses to talk about the fact that Palestinians and Israelis can talk to one another and work with one another. We also know and recognize that if we're going to live with each other in Palestine, Israel, we're going to have to work with one another. But we're going to demonstrate not simply by lip service, but by by example, what it means to collaborate and cooperate and to be on the same side of a conflict that pits us on different sides. So I'll sort of end there and, I, and, and let Karen chime in. Karen? Yeah, so first of all, thank you so much for including me here and for uh, Shibli for your leadership. Uh, and you, know, I, I, you and I, again, go back a uh, long time and and it's really been uh, an honor and a pleasure to work on this with Amani, a long friend and colleague at Princeton. And she's exactly right. Um, I, I rarely come out as, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm a scholar of international security. I'm not even a scholar of this conflict per se, but it was so important uh, for us, for me, um, to see on the one hand, I was really excited that people are the students are taking this moment to ask more questions and want to know more about the conflict. And there is uh, a moment there that is that we need to step in because there is more curiosity, there is more of, of, of a desire to understand better. But what we also saw on campus that was becoming very alarming is that a lot of what we saw was in slogans and in a very polarized uh, way of, of zero sum of simplified reality. And that's, you know, protests and all that have a really important place on campus in the history of democratic societies and all that. But as university, on university campuses, you wanna make sure that that's not the only way we engage with this conflict that there is room and there is a need to bring the students into classrooms to have difficult conversations, to be able to hold two things at the same time, to really think about the complexity of the conflict, the history, 
and reject very reductionist narratives. Uh, anyone who would give you a reductionist narrative of how to understand the conflict, I would be very suspicious of, of, of that person's um, uh, credibility in teaching about this conflict. Anybody who will tell you that the solution is also very simple is one where we, I think we need to really bring the complexity in and have discussions that include difficult truths and hard truths for us to um, discuss and debate and do this in a civil way and do this in a way that we listen to one another and be really uh, uh, willing to wrestle with with complex, difficult questions. And that's for us as leaders, uh, as deans, is to model this a little bit, uh, is to show that it's important that we do this together, uh, that it can be done, uh, that we're doing this all the time. Shibli, when I and you and I talk, we, you know, we can have conversation for hours about this. And we can agree and we can disagree. And and Amani and I do the same things. And um, and that's what I want our students to be able to do. Now, some of them uh, want, need to know more, uh, have, you know, and that's also our responsibility to be able to offer that. But I think in terms of a skill, is a skill in terms of learning to listen uh, um, and, and really be comfortable with disagreement. Uh, be comfortable to be in a room where you're not only with people who dis who agree with you. If you're in such a room, you're probably in the wrong room. So that's that requires a lot of hard work. Um, and so um, um, Amani and I uh, st started that, and it's a process that it's not just for the students, it's for faculty, it's for all of us uh, to work at. Before I turn to Hannah, because I, I want to focus particularly about the, the freedom of speech and how we navigate that space, uh, because obviously we need to talk about practicality and defending the interests of every group on campus, every student groups, faculty, staff, everybody has rights and they all have equal rights. And we need to navigate that space and regardless of whether it's a, an Arab group, a Jewish group, a black group, a Hispanic group, a white group, whatever it is. We need to navigate that space and we have to figure out how to do it in practice. But I want, to, in a way, still to ask the two of you a question about the hats that you're wearing, right? So you are talking, you're going between sort of like the analytical, because you're both scholars, you can't escape that. So you're talking about, we need to have this kind of conversation as scholars or maybe even as public figures to bring people but then you really are, you have constituencies with rights who may disagree with you even, right? Other faculty members, staff, you have student constituencies, uh, you have uh, administrators, uh, not your administrators, but they also hire administrators that are making policies you may, or, may agree or disagree with. You're gonna have to navigate that space. And then you have outside groups, donors that you all have to fundraise, um, who, who feel they have to have a voice. You have groups that write to you or are mobilized to impact you. Uh, so all of these are activated in times of crisis like these. Everybody is activated. So how are you navigating that space? Um, uh, you know, between, you know, just walking, just even those constituencies I describe alone, Amani and Karen, if you would, would tell us just a little bit particularly about sort of, you know, how, what kind of reaction you've been getting and, and where, where is the heat coming from, so to speak, and how are you balancing it? And I know you, you know, this is, this is not something that I'm asking you basically about specifics since you are still deans in practice and you have responsibilities, uh, but just in, in general, how do you, how, you know, sort of what approach do you take in navigating that space? So, so I went first last time. Does Karen want to go first this time? <laughs> I love your tactic, Amani. Yeah, sure. I'll uh, I'll go first. So I, I'm not going to lie. It's it's been incredibly, incredibly difficult and painful. Um, painful for all the reasons that you can imagine. Um, different constituency will look at me and they will assume a lot of things about me just by the fact of where I grew up and, and so on. Um, but I do feel that it's, it, it should never be, and it never is about me. 
Um, I actually see this as as a re as, as challenging as it is, and it's very challenging. The moment that this is a very critical moment in terms of uh, uh, how not just in the moment in terms of the conflict, but how we engage with those with that conflict here in the United States on campuses. And I want to focus on how I I you know use the platform and the and 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 the you know being a dean of a policy school, especially is about training the next generation of leaders to know how to be leaders in polarized societies, to know how to engage with one another uh, over issues they disagree with in order to find a place, a consensus. That's what they will have to do as leaders. And I try to really use every, you know, I, I teach 375 students every week about crisis decision-making. Um, and uh, and I, I work you know, as a capacity of a dean of a very diverse community. So I feel that it's constantly, I, they look to me um, to see how I handle this and what I preach and how I talk about the importance of, sure, free speech, but also thinking about how we build a community. How do we create dialogues? Um, it's not been, it has not been easy at all. There are things that I obviously fundamentally disagree with in terms of how universities have gone uh, about it, uh, certain universities, and, and, and sometimes you get requests from students that you look at and you say, this is not what uh, I'm going to do, even though that means that there's going to be huge uh, uh, backlash uh, because, you know, uh, you know, people want some certain certain things or statements and so on. So it's constantly navigating. But the, the, the important part for me is to lead with moral clarity, but to also think about how we bring the community together. Um, and that gets into issues of how do you balance the free speech with safety concerns? How do you balance free speech with um, with just the idea of you have different people and different communities that that you want to bring in and into conversation? And so what would be productive? Uh, how do you facilitate that? Those are the the questions that I wrestle yeah. with. But uh, yeah, it's been challenging, yeah. but again, it's a very important moment. And so, Amani, if you'd add to that, and I, you know, it's interesting. Karen said, you know, people expect just because you know who you are inevitably. I mean, everybody sees themselves as a professional wearing a hat, but people kind of say, well, you know, you know, you were saying you're an Israeli American, you're a Palestinian American. Uh, they, they expect you also have community pressures. You know, they expect you to to be in one place or the other. So, how are you navigating that? Yes, and, and just to echo Karen, it's been extremely challenging, Shibli, because uh, people sort of assume, well, because I'm Palestinian, it means I'm going to be squarely pro-Palestinian, which means by default, I'll probably be anti-Israel or anti-Jewish, which is not the case, right? So part of the issue is sort of understanding where the, the polarization is. So I made a point early on in the uh, events to go to the Center for Jewish Life on our campus, for example, just express my sympathies and horror about what happened. Uh, similarly, so I met with Jewish students and I also met with Muslim students. So again, as an administrator, uh, just trying to acknowledge and, and listen, but also sort of recognize the pain and suffering of what our students are going through. Like in the end of the day, Shibli, yes, you know, we know that free speech is of prized value on our campuses, but these communities, whether the Jewish or Muslim, you know, they, they have the, their own, there are these pasts that we can't ignore. It's not like in a vacuum, right? You know, anti-Semitism and, and, and Islamophobia, they have sort of dire consequences for how people think about their own security and safety. And as administrators, it's, you know, we, we, we sort of, need to need to sort of appreciate that a little bit more and maybe you know again not say simply say that we're going to compromise freedom of speech but to say e even if there's this speech we want to make sure that you also in this space feel secure uh, and safe acknowledged respected and and more importantly that you belong at this institution so if you're preaching a discourse of inclusion that applies to everyone then that should help it, it, and it really takes the work of a community. Sometimes, unfortunately, you know, 
we can talk about this in, in more detail, Shibli, but we, we sort of assume that, you know, uh, things will often resolve itself and everything will converge on uh, harmoniously on their own. And that's not always the case. Um, as administrators, we have to sort of, you know, be in the trenches and, and being in the trenches is not pleasant all the time. Like, for example, you know, um, in the same week, I could have a truck doxing me, calling me anti-Semitic. And then the next day, stu students protesting, saying that uh, the school supports genocide because, you know, you're trying to carefully thread that middle road and carefully ensure that your community is represented and taken care of. It means that you're going to have to take some some punches, unfortunately, in this time in, 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 in age. Um, but it's something that we have to keep pushing forward on. Um, but I, you know, the, 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 this issue of making sure that our students, even in the worst of circumstances, feel included and belong and belong on our campuses is extremely important. Yeah. Uh, I, I want to turn to Hina and, and bring her into the conversation on the issue, uh, particularly that, that the ACLU cares about the most. Obviously, that's the uh, why the ACLU is there. And um, I want to start by, you know, I, I know Hina, you know, Amani and, and, and Karen in their article in the New York Times say, uh, campuses must protect free speech and equally advocate for mutually respectful dialogue. Uh, now, in... Um, uh, uh, the ACLU um, sent an open letter to U.S. Uh, college uh, and university presidents. Um, it was signed by the leadership of ACLU, including you. Uh, and um, I'm just going to uh, quote one uh, part of it and, and ask you to kind of give us again a context about sort of why you did this, how, what you see the, the problems are on campus and what led you to, to say it the way you did. Uh, so you say... The ACLU is a U.S.-focused uh, civil liberties um, and human rights organization, and as a matter of official policy, does not take positions on uh, uh, other uh, nations' uh, 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 overseas conflicts. We do, however, strongly oppose efforts to stifle free speech, free association, and academic freedom here at home. Uh, in the name of those principles, we urge you to reject calls to investigate, disband, or penalize student groups on the basis of their exercise of free speech rights. So um, could you walk us through this? First of all, what kind of led you to issue this open letter and, and sort of how you see this uh, free speech issue playing out on campuses now as the ACLU yeah, and Chibli, thank you for that question, and and thank you to my uh, fellow panelists um, and to Dean Rivera for for a rich conversation. And I think um, let me start by saying this: you know, I have a colleague whose work, significant amount of his work, is on campus speech and student speech workshops and working with administrators. And one thing that he does, which I think is so right, is that he says, you know, put aside the First Amendment for a second. If people in your community are hurting, that's already a problem there. So what are you going to do that is empowering, that is hearing, that is listening, that is allowing people to address their concerns? So that's partly why I was so happy, well, happy is the wrong word, but just mm -hmm. you know, appreciative of both what Amani and Karen were saying, because these are really, really tough issues. And it's not as if speech on campuses was straightforward before October 7th either. I think in multiple parts of the yeah. country, you know, there have been significant speech restriction issues very often coming from politicians and, and legislators that people are having to deal with. Um, and so what we were seeing, you know, obviously after um, on and after October 7th is that um, the devastation of the conflict roiling campuses here at home, um, recognizing at the same time that um, what administrators and, and university leaders are having to do is complicated and challenging. You're talking about emotion, pain, you're talking about teaching, um, you're talking about all of these 
things that we've we've been talking about. And at the same time, again, before October 7th, we'd already been seeing a rise um, in anti-Semitic, anti-Palestinian, anti-Arab, anti-Muslim discrimination. There'd been documented threats against um, people in, in of our various communities. And that just increased exponentially, obviously, um, after. And we saw um, college students across the country doing what college students do, which is to exercise their constitutional right to free speech by organizing and protesting and posting and debating, and sometimes resulting in speech that is intemperate, hateful to some, abhorrent to others, all of those things. And I think what caused us to write this letter was sort of the very opposite of the title of this panel, which is Constructive Conversations, right? The very opposite of Constructive Conversations was calls to schools to investigate um, pro-Palestinian students and student groups for material support for terrorism without any evidentiary basis for such a very, very serious allegation. Um, and we, I um, certainly have very long experience and concerns about abusive and discriminatory material support investigations and prosecutions, particularly in the post 9-11 era. Um, and we know just how damaging um, these kinds of sweeping and insubstantiated allegations can be for people's personal and professional lives. And especially when there was stigma being attached to young people exercising their First Amendment rights with the ter terrorism label, that is dangerous. It is wrong. And it can carry really serious long-term consequences for those who are being unfairly uh, maligned. And what it boils down to, especially when it's done by public universities and, and politicians, um, and you know, we can talk about this, which is uh, a lawsuit that we subsequently filed on behalf of our uh, client, the University of Florida chapter of Students for Justice for Palestine uh, against the public university there. Um, what it is, is it's a violation of the constitution, right? And a blatant and harmful effort to chill speech. Um, and what we wanted to make clear in this letter, and again, I'm happy to sort of talk about it is, is the principles of free speech on campus and making very, very clear that material support does not include independent political advocacy um, and student group speech was not unlawful to the contrary. So that's and why we sent that letter to 650 college and university presidents. No, no, feel free to talk about that Florida case, but, um, uh, the, you know, I mean, you are the ACLU and you obviously are not focused on the Middle East, you're focused on the, about all free speech, domestic uh, free speech. And and so in a case like that one that you're taking up for students in, in Florida, um, is there, a, you know, another kind of case that you can talk about that's similar in, in sort of that it doesn't bear on the Middle East or or... Uh, that 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 you think you know the, the the principle is the same, but it's not the same kind of example. Yes, and you've actually given me a, a very good lead in to talk about what the main sort of the the main sort of theory and behind our cases, our clients' cases, which is a um, a case called Healy versus James it's over fifty years ago, and this is a case that came. Um, at another sort of time of really deep division in this country, um, at the Vietnam War era, when students were protesting and engaged in advocacy and so on. Um, and that's a case that essentially establishes very, very clearly the right of student groups to associate and speak out on matters of public concern, free from censorship, uh, by public university officials. And in that case, that involved um, the president of a public college in Connecticut had denied recognition to a local chapter of Students for Democratic Society. For those of us of a certain age, that um, name might be very sort of familiar. Um, based on that uh, 
SDS's sort of perceived association with a national organization and the national organization sort of radical philosophy and actions. And the court, the Supreme Court reiterated, and I think this is so important, that the vigilant protection of constitutional freedoms is, um, is nowhere more vital than in the community of American schools. That is where you have a marketplace of ideas and where speech has got to be protected even and especially in times of fear, tension, and anguish. And well, he, this is, it. yeah, no, this is great. And this is interesting because in fact, um, Amani and Karen in their article uh, wrote the following sentence, I wanna read it, said, universities should not retreat into their ivory towers because the discourse has gotten toxic. On the contrary, the discourse will get more toxic if universities pull back. And this is really kind of an interesting uh, statement, but it, it runs against a certain reality that I want to share with you. And that is in a public opinion poll that we have just carried about among scholars in American universities who specialize in the Middle East. This is our Middle East Scholar Barometer, which we, which we uh, held after, it just last month. Uh, from November 10 to 17, uh, 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 on the question of uh, free speech on campus or self-censorship when they speak professionally. So I want to share some of the results with you when I get your reaction on it, but I want to give you a little bit of a background about the Middle East Style Scholar Barometer, which I have to say has a connection in both Columbia and, and uh, Princeton, because Amani is actually on the uh, on the board of a, the advisory board of the Middle East Scholar Barometer, which I co-direct with Mark Lynch, and uh, Lisa Anderson, your one of your predecessors, Karen, is um, also on the board of advisors for for this. Uh, this is mostly a political science group. Uh, in fact, the majority of people that we pull are political scientists, and mostly um, uh, as members of the American Political Science Association who specify. Uh, the Middle East as a specialty, uh, as well as members of POMIPS, which is a, an organization made up of political scientists focused on the Middle East. We also have um, members of the American Historical Association and uh, the Middle East Studies Association. Uh, there's overlap of membership sometimes, but we have those. We're actually mostly because we're all political scientists, including all the advisory group, and most of our questions typically about uh, the Middle East political questions. Uh, we try to contrast it with non-political scientists. So we we have, we break it political scientists, non-political scientists. Uh, but I'm gonna give you the some of the results from the US-based members. We, we In our poll, we netted about 926 um, um, responses um, and uh, the, about two thirds of them were in the US, uh, some that were international. We're only gonna give the US results, obviously, because this is what we're talking about, American campuses. Uh, so let me start with this first uh, first slide. So the question was, um, do you feel the need to self-censor on the Israeli-Palestinian issue in academic or professional capacity, right? We're not talking about, you know, whether they can talk about it publicly, and we're talking about the professional capacity, uh, academic capacity. And so it's really quite astonishing in a way when you look at it, you see that um, uh, overall, 82% say they, they, they self-censor. They feel the need to self-censor. And uh, if you look at it with, you know, in terms of junior faculty member, 98% um, uh, feel a need to self-censor of the assistant professors and 95% you know, of uh, the graduate students. It's really extraordinary at a time when as, as you have all been arguing, that's what we need, a vibrant academy to speak out, speak truth, uh, to be frank uh, in its uh, description. Uh, these people are saying uh, they self-censor. And by the way, we had a question about, uh, did they, the, the, they self-censor more uh, because of the war that started October 7th? We had three quarters say yes. So a lot of them feel a greater need to self-censor. Obviously that is reflected here. But here's the second question and second slide. So um, on essentially among those 82% who said they self-censor, we asked um, 
you know, what are you self, you know, what are you self-censoring uh, most when you when you're speaking out? Anti-criticism of Palestinians, criticism of Israel, criticism of U.S. policy, and take a look. You know, 81% say criticism of Israel is what they censor most. Uh, 11% say criticism of Palestinians. Uh, uh, 2% say criticism of U.S. policy. Um, then I want to show you the third slide. Um, and um, uh, so where are the, you know, what are the primary reasons, um, you know, that they speak out in terms of where they feel the pressure coming from? Um, and you could see here, they could, they could um, check all that applies, right? So it's not just one answer. They can, they can check all the answers that apply. You can see that uh, roughly 60% say concerns about campus culture or offending students. Uh, and this, the next one is concerns about pressure from external advocacy group, 53%. And then the third is concern about discipline from academic administrators uh, at, your, at their institutions. 16% uh, worry about government legal restrictions. I suspect that many more will be worried about that after the congressional hearing, uh, including presidents from uh, uh, pre university presidents. Uh, and uh, not, you know, another 19% worry about affecting institutional fundraising. I also want to add here before I open it up for your reaction to this. Um, um, I want to add that um, if you look at the number one answer, which is concerned about um, campus culture and offending students, uh, that's not necessarily all bad in theory, right? Because you can be sensitive, you know, we, you all have said that we all have to be sensitive to our students and this culture, you don't wanna offend. Uh, it's not that you shy away from telling the truth, but you need to also interact with students and 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 and, uh, and make sure that your language or your uh, statements are not in some ways um, uh, offensive uh, to to students or, or other campus groups. So that's one, one interpretation, but we have in fact given um, the scholars, um, uh, the ability to write some feedbacks of examples. And I would say the overwhelming majority of the examples were not about uh, sort of being polite or diplomatic, is more about concern of uh, negative reaction. Uh, across the board, we, we wrote a, a, an article about it uh, that you can find uh, in the Chronicle of Higher Education a few days ago. Uh, where we actually summarize some of the findings and the examples uh, that scholars, uh, 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 you know, uh, described in their uh, uh, in, in, in their write up, uh, where we we gave them ability to put like fifty words, uh, and we were really shocked by how many people wanted to talk and give examples. So I want to go back to you, uh, Amani and Karen, uh, you know, in, in your capacities as dean. Um, how do you read this, um, you know, in terms of at a time when you're saying we, we need to, you know, be vibrant and and then suddenly you have people who are actually supposed to be the scholars. And again, remember, these are mostly political scientists. OK, the majority of those are political scientists. Uh, I think nearly two thirds of political scientists. So um, the, how do we interpret this? Uh, and is this not concerning? Uh, and. And how do we provide the space for them, uh, especially given where they see as the sources of problem uh, for yeah. that lead them to to be more right. uh, self censoring? Um, I can jump in. Um, well, some of it is not really surprising to me. Um, in many conversations I've had uh, with the money and others in the in the academy, we. We know that this for many, many years has been a topic that's been a hot topic. To get people, uh, faculty, to teach on this, uh, on the Arab-Israeli conflict is something that um, um, many, many people, many in the academy uh, didn't want to because they knew that this was a political, a politically charged uh, topic, that they were scared. Uh, in different ways from different groups from uh, and didn't want to, and especially in, a, in an age of cancel culture and you have cell phones in the class and uh, everything becomes so politi political and politicized. So we actually created in many universities, I would argue, vacuum 
for a long time that we didn't offer classes on the Arab-Israeli conflict and we're paying the price for it because we have a generation of students who just know very little because there were just not enough classes that were offered. We also had a different problem where we created in some universities cohort of like-minded scholars teaching in one particular narrative, uh, very sometimes reductionist narrative on this, and from that moment on, nobody could enter that space because in that department because there was just one narrative of the conflict that was dominant. Yeah. And so, so what are the trends that you are describing? I, I, we've probably seen them uh, in a long time, and we're and again we're paying the price for it because there's just not enough on this to begin with. Then you add October seven, and you have phenomena like. Um, uh, doxing that uh, has, you know, been really, really hurtful. Uh, and I, you know, the first, I mean, it was just like disgusting and, and really, really problematic. And that will lead to both students not wanting to engage in this kind of dialogue that we want to have because they will be scared uh, and faculty will be concerned. Um, and then you have uh, this atmosphere that is very charged and becoming very difficult. Now, when you saw, so I'm not surprised by the numbers. I think the numbers were there before October 7. I think that that there are fundamental questions to be to even ask who even teaches on this conflict to begin with. Uh, and and who what are the selection uh, bias that we get to, uh, in the first place. But I also think that there are, uh, and this is where Amani and I wrote in the op-ed, that the difference between criticism of the Israeli government, which, as you know, and in academia, we should be very critical of all governments with one who with the foreign, if when we agree, disagree with their foreign policy or tactics or whatever it is, uh, that should be legitimate. That should be a part of a conversation about foreign policy anywhere, anytime, uh, including the Israeli government. I think where you're getting now into the conversation where it's becoming uh, harder and more complex. And this is another topic we will have to unpack. At what point you're moving from criticizing a government of another country to criticizing a concept like that Zionism to veering towards issues of anti-Zionism. And I think a lot of people are just don't feel that they know where this, where, uh, how to navigate this. And yes. that leads to overall chilling effect. And but, that's also part of the education that we will have but, to, you know, the but, conversations we will have to have. Let me let me clarify. Um, those scholars uh, don't necessarily teach the Arab-Israeli issue. They're, they're, yes. they're um, most, mostly political scientists in the Middle East. So they could be teaching a course gotcha. and, uh, you know, on anything related to the Middle East. But yeah. obviously Israel-Palestine is going to come out. Yeah. come up or they're asked to do uh, to talk about a profession Very so it's not it, yeah. though I, I suspect the overwhelming majority are not necessarily talking about the, the specific class on israel mm -hmm. but amani and 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 Hina, i'd like to hear from you in terms of how you react to what you saw in terms of the data so if i may um i, I want to say like I'm not surprised by the data, Shibli. Um, as Karen said, I think there's been a huge vacuum. I think the vacuum is basically uh, been perpetuated by the very sort of tense climate around this topic. But I do want to add that the self censorship on the uh, 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 you know in terms of criticizing Israel. Um, just to pick up where where Karen left off, I think that because everything is so zero sum, and I want to not just put it on universities, Shibli, because this the whole United States is very polarized, not only around this issue, but around almost any single topic is become zero sum. Um, you know, with the advent also of social media, it just exacerbated this problem. But when you already have a media, media establishment, and let's just like you, you were in a country where the United States is a very strong ally of Israel and the media establishment along with the political establishment doesn't allow for much room for critical and thoughtful analysis for this topic. So it's not only a problem on our university campuses, Shibli. This is a problem that's pervasive across the United States more generally, which is that any sort of even constructive criticism of 
Israel is often it evokes negative reactions. I always say that you can get much more criticism of Israel within Israeli society than you can ever get in the United States because everything is reduced to black and white, zero sum. Um, you are then anti-Israel and then worse, anti-Zionist and anti-Semitic. Like, so, and so it doesn't allow, it's much easier. So if you go back and put up that chart for one, one second, the, the the junior faculty are the ones most likely to self-censor. Right, 98%. They, they yeah. don't want their academic careers to be destroyed over this issue. It's just not and, worth it for them. And they say so in the comments, they say so in the comments, by the way. I mean, it's right. obvious. And the grad students the same way. But but that so, also reflects yeah. a lack of sophistication more generally in our institutions of higher education and in American society writ large about how can we have thoughtful discourse around this issue on both the Palestinian well, Israeli side. It's I want to come back to I want to come back to that. I want to come back to that. I want to give because there is one more slide I want to show. I know you all have to leave pretty sharp. So I really want to squeeze in one more slide, but I want to hear if Hina has a has a, a point to make on these slides, because I want to show this last slide and and end with one more question. I mean oh, just very briefly, I mean I'm not surprised either. And I think what I want to harken back, you know, there's a lot of reference to McCarthyism and McCarthyite, especially now. And I think that if there's a single most important lesson of that era for what we're talking about is that ideologically motivated efforts to police speech, faculty or student speech, they they not only backfire in some of the ways that Karen and Amani have been talking about, but they they damage the foundation on which on academic communities are built and flourish and students need to learn from and professors need to teach. So just, again, not surprised. Yeah, so I wanna show this last uh, uh, last slide and I, I want to just uh, have you uh, take a look at it. And it's about to what extent are the following, uh, you know, probably in your institution. And we, we essentially put out there anti-Semitism, anti-Muslim, anti-Israeli, anti-Palestinian. Uh, sort of what is, what is more, and so I'm, I have these a lot, uh, somewhat a little, not a lot, and so forth. So think of the first category, people who say a lot or somewhat uh, uh, following. So you have, uh, um, you know, the, the highest category is anti-Palestinian sentiment. 50% say it is uh, a lot or somewhat prevalent. Um, the And next comes the anti-Muslim sentiment, 41%. Next comes the anti-Israeli sentiment, 36%. And next comes um, anti-Semitic sentiment, which is almost 18%. So, you know, there are a couple of things here that that uh, obviously you can see um, uh, reporting. These are, of course, reported by scholars of the Middle East on their own campuses. They may or may not be accurate. That's the way they sense them. Other people may sense them differently. We have to be clear about that. But the way they see it, obviously, there's a differentiation, obviously, between anti-Palestinian uh, and anti-Muslim. Obviously, it's not the same numbers. And certainly, a differentiation between anti-Israel uh, and anti-Semitic. I mean, uh, you almost double the numbers say anti-Israel, but not anti-Semitic, in part because a lot of people obviously differentiate. Uh, in fact, actually, anti uh, Israel, the criticism of Israel became common in the American political mainstream. You know, the most recent Gallup poll showed uh, two thirds of Democrats um, uh, 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 don't think Israeli action in Gaza is justified. Two, two thirds, uh, 45 percent of all Americans, majority of women, uh, two thirds of uh, uh, people of color, uh, uh, two thirds of, of young people overall, not just Democrats. So the criticism of Israel is, is uh, very, very much present, um, are we facing a situation now, particularly because of the infusion of political discourse that we see, of people conflating the two in a way that's dangerous and particularly leading to a little bit more self-censorship? So I'd like each one of you to say something about it before we end, starting with you, Karen, since I know that you're going to have to leave yeah. almost on uh, time. So, Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think, uh, yes, to some extent, but I want to say something about the anti-Semitism, because I, I am even in my university, even if when I talk to my colleagues, they would probably 
maybe you will see similar numbers. What I'm exposed to as a dean in terms of the, the cases that are being reported to me that I know are happening on campus, uh, that information stays with me. This is not shared. So there is a real gap in terms of what faculty know about what's actually happening on campus. And it's not just about anti-Semitism. It's about incidents that are happening to Palestinian students, to Muslim students, to, to Jewish students. I think we really have a problem of how much and how we share the 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 uh, who knows what's really happening online on campus and so on. So there's so what will be interesting is to compare those numbers, Shibley, at some point, to how students are experiencing this on campus. I have a feeling that there is something about the 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 echo of the, the kind of faculty not really being really in the know of what's really happening to their students on campuses. But I think overall, the point that you are showing is uh, is highly problematic. I mean, what we're, all of those uh, sentiments that, that, that are there, I, I think that uh, we have a lot of work to do. And I don't think that we have done um, enough or uh, that we really are in control of how we make sure that our students feel safe and that our faculty feel safe talking or even physically safe. So I think that this is the moment for us to, when we go to break, to come back and really work hard on how we do better for our community. Yeah, and Amani, I'm gonna give you a chance to uh, uh, say something about this and then give the final word to Hina. Yeah, no, um, it's, it's, look at all forms of hate, um, and whether it's Islam Islamophobic or uh, anti-Semitic or anti-Palestinian or anti-Israeli, right? Just simply because of these ascriptive identities that people feel that they're in a hostile environment, that that's upon us and, and the responsibility lays with us to try, try to create a, a more hospitable environment. Um, the, the the truth is, Shibli, uh, it, it it you know at least when you think about these numbers um, and and existing trends, ideally what we want is for every single student, regardless of their background, to feel included and uh, not necessarily mm -hmm. facing hateful re rhetoric as such. Um, and hate speech is very injurious, and I think we're going to have to grapple with this. And I'm curious to how what what recommendations. Hina has for us as administrators, well, we, yes, support free speech as those, as your numbers show. I mean, you know, a third of people affiliated with Israel, 50% of Muslims uh, or 40% of Muslims, 50% of Palestinians, those are, are huge numbers in this day and age for people to feel or our students to feel. And if Karen is correct, those don't even reflect the accurate numbers, which might be even higher. How do we as administrators satisfy and commit ourselves to inclusivity for everyone, able to stand up to, to hate, hate speech, but also guarantee free speech? What would Hina tell us? If not to leave the burden on you, Hina, but just in, in the spirit of having a constructive conversation around this. It yeah. falls on you, Hina. <laughs> <laughs> Look, Administrators, you all, you have a hard job to do, and it is a painful job to do. And and yet at the same time, you can do it within both free speech, free expression, recognizing what is and is not protected. So, you know, neither the First Amendment nor uh, academic freedom principles, um, they don't protect speech that is a serious and imminent threat of harm right, or an incitement to violence, or speech that pervasively harasses someone based on protected characteristics. And, and you all have an obligation to confront that speech when you see it committed by or directed at members of your community. And sometimes it's a legal question. And these are hard lines to draw. And that's the responsibility, right? But restrictions on speech, teaching people why even in hate speech in this country is protected because 
and the reasons why that may be the case. Like I find a lot of students, a lot of young people don't understand that the First Amendment actually protects that and the reasons that the First Amendment protects that. And we should talk about that. But the answer cannot be, and I'm not taking you all to be saying this, but the answer cannot be to restrict speech or overly punitive come at it punitively. The environment is hard enough as it is. So the answer has to be sort of talking things through, restorative approaches, um, not punitive, restrictive, banning kinds of approaches. That's a, a, a very good place to end. I am so grateful to the three of you for taking the time to join us. This was a, an excellent conversation. I learned a lot myself. We're all grappling with this is no simple answer. I bet you that uh, Dean Rivera was listening attentively because she too has to deal with these issues like every administrator uh, in, in this country and, and actually in many campuses around the world. So I'm really grateful for enlightening us, for joining us. I look forward to seeing you uh, personally at some point. And thanks again for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank Thanks you for having us. Thanks very much.